Dennis. Thanks for uh, joining us this evening for uh, an excursion to uh, the Big Apple on Long Island. Um, we've got uh, <clears throat> Heather Wolf joining us. Uh, her patch is Brooklyn Bridge Park, which is uh, a really interesting area. And you'll find out as she talks. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I think what we'll do is we'll just get going. And uh, Heather, you can uh, introduce yourself and uh, and a little bit about what you're uh, what you do. And uh, sounds great. And okay, I'm going to uh, go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. That's good. And remember to enable my my audio, which I always yeah. get to do. Let me see. That is true. <laughs> so let's see. And if everybody else would mute yourselves so that we don't have distractions while Heather's speaking. That would be great. So yeah, so I, um, thanks. Thank you, Dennis, and everyone for having me. This is so awesome um, to be here and share with you all. You're, you're actually really close to me. And I hope we can all burn together soon enough when we when we can do things like that. Um, so I, I work for Cornell Lab of Ornithology from home as a web developer. I work on eBird and BirdCast, Birds of the World, all these really cool projects from the lab. And I also share the birds uh, of, of my patch uh, with people in the community through bird walks and classes and talks and really any way I can. So um, this is just what I love to do. And I, I just can't wait to share um, my patch with you tonight and some of the surprising things that have happened there. Um, so uh, I like to start my talks with this quote from Thoreau, lead such a life as a children that chase butterflies in the meadow. And of course I added um, birds to the mix here because you know a lot of us love birds, of course. But really, I think what happens a lot of us when, we, uh, when we're adults, especially probably not the group here, but our community and the people that we want to share this with, we, they lose that magic of being a kid and marveling at birds and butterflies. And we know that what birding is like and we know that it, it's that magic and it really does bring us back to the, the giddiness of being a kid and marveling at these things. And it's really amazing, especially in tough times like this or, or really any time. And um, I really, um, that, that's one of the things I just love about burning. So I, I just love this idea of going back to our youth. And I'm, I'm really a patch birder. So as you'll see, um, I, I bird one location quite a bit. And that makes it even more fun because I know the place so well that I, that I can get even more amazed when something exciting happens out of the norm. So um, how did I get into birding? Well, I, I actually had lived in Brooklyn for about five years and I moved to the Gulf Coast of Florida. And that's where I fell in love with birds. I was surrounded by birds. I, I lived on a barrier island called Pensacola Beach. And uh, I, I started noticing birds there. And on a trip back to Brooklyn just to visit, I came across this uh, Birder's Life List and Diary, which I actually found. I had lost it. I just came across it the other day again. It's here in, in the flesh, in the paper. And um, I was fascinated because I opened it and it had all these empty, you know, well, not empty anymore, but empty places to put birds. And I said, wow, people do this? This, this is so amazing. It was in a used bookstore. So I bought it, sat on my coffee table for back in Florida for months, but eventually I started birding and then I moved back to Brooklyn and fortunately lived right next to this amazing place called Brooklyn Bridge Park. So I'm going to talk about that tonight and, and really I'm not going to like cover these topics necessarily in sequence, but the things I'm going to touch on are take you through a stroll through a virtual tour of Brooklyn Bridge Park. And while we're doing that, we're gonna learn about the, how effective the many habitats that this, this urban park has created, how effective they are in attracting amazing birds to this park that you would never think, you know, a park this small um, would, would attract. Yeah, also, yeah. how does, how does, 
<laughs> oh, someone someone has their audio on. Yeah, if you could please mute, please mute yourselves. Yeah, everybody mute. So also how patch birding can raise awareness in, in our communities and beyond. Okay, so so this uh, is my patch. This is um this is Brooklyn. This Bridge. is Brooklyn Bridge. And this is uh, obviously the Brooklyn Bridge, and this is in fall. So one of the most beautiful times of uh, all throughout the North uh, is, is in fall when we have the leaves changing. So somebody this is, is somebody is not muted. Please mute okay, Someone isn't muted. Let's, um, can we see that on the chat? For anybody who's been to the beach, it's very difficult to do. And if you Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay, so... Um, so this is this is Pier One um, at my patch, and basically, this is also a view on from across. You see Lower Manhattan right across from Pier One in Brooklyn, and uh, what's really cool about this is right in this this building here. We see where the arrow is pointing. We have peregrine falcons that nest there uh, every summer at spring, and they raise the young during the summer and. Uh, you know, New York City actually has the highest density of peregrine falcons anywhere in the world. So raptors are big in cities. Um, we get also get a lot of red-tailed hawks. Uh, I usually see one every day in, in the patch. And I'll, usually when I hear crows cawing, that means there's some drama ensuing. Uh, what's really funny is that light post there where, the, where you see the, uh, the hawk. The hawk was actually perched there the crow perched next to it and started nonchalantly looking into the, the tubular metal post because it does that to hunt uh, house sparrow fledglings. But it wasn't the season to be hunting house sparrow fledglings, but it did it anyway. But it was funny because it was trying to act like it did care that the hawk didn't bother it. And eventually the hawk chased it out of the area. So these are normal kind of things you would expect in an urban environment, um, you know, a lot of raptors. Also, we have beautiful views in my patch because it's looking out onto the Statue of Liberty, Lower Manhattan, the bridge, as we've seen. And it really, if you ever, if you ever um, want to visit the patch, I could show you the, the best spots to get photos like this where you wait. This was a lucky shot. We don't often get Brent right in front of the, of the statue, but in getting shots of gulls and turns in the summer in front of the bridge and statue is relatively easy. And just this as a backdrop for birding is, is really, really makes it even more amazing every time I go out there. Um, so where, where I live is where the greenhouse is at the bottom of this orange rectangle. So uh, what you're seeing is Brooklyn. I live just about a mile and a half south of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is at the top of the, tri of, of the rectangle. And what the rectangle is, is basically a series of piers in Brooklyn Bridge Park. So as you can see, the landscape is a little weird. It's a long park. It doesn't have a lot of room, a lot of space, but it does have these piers that jut out. And when I started birding in 2012, really those piers were not developed yet. The only pier that was, was this pier one that was right under uh, the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is the view of that pier from the Brooklyn Bridge. There's, that's also Governor's Island out in the back to the right. But really what amazes me about this, this little patch, um, when, I, when I first started birding this, uh, I, I was aiming to get a, at least 100 species. And uh, I got definitely, you know, 80% of the species I was seeing along that stretch were in this little patch. It has a variety of habitats, which I'm gonna be showing you a couple of lawns and ponds and all sorts of trees. But this little patch, uh, this mini patch within Brooklyn Bridge Park attracts warblers, vireos, even rails, thrushes, all sorts of really cool things. Uh, speaking of rails, this is probably the rarest sighting I had right on that, on that Pier 1. It was a Sora that touched down uh, back probably I think in 2015 or 2016. And of course, as you can imagine, this attracted attention and a lot of people from the tri-state area made a trip down to come see this rail. It was very strange to have it on a lawn, right? This is not a normal habitat for rail, but it probably landed here. And luckily it found its way over to uh, what I call the long pond. And I'll be showing you pictures of the long pond, a more suitable habitat with some water. So why, why do all these birds stop here? I've seen, at this point, I've seen 173 species in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Uh, 
obviously most of those are migratory. And really, why are they stopping in this little long park right under the Brooklyn Bridge in this heavily urban and often industrial area? Uh, habitat, really. It's all about the habitat. And it really doesn't matter how small and many it is. Uh, it may take longer to attract certain species, as we'll see as we go through this. But uh, really, if, if it's there, if the habitat's there, the birds are going to find their way. That, that's my silhouette there. And these are a, a series of um, Northern Catalpa and Polonia trees. And Polonia trees are non-native, but they're, they're very similar to the Catalpas in, in that they're, they have these huge leaves that are basically a warbler magnet. So the birds and kinglets as well uh, forage on the undersides of the leaves, which collect a lot of insects. And then as these leaves fall, you've got the leaf litter. So you have always have oven birds. And not only that, the Polonia trees have these beautiful purple blooms with a lot of nectar, which attract ruby-throated hummingbirds and Baltimore Orioles every migration season. I've even seen Orioles and these Orioles and the hummingbirds fighting over the nectar. <laughs> so it, there is a lot of action going on. This is a pure one that's called the Top of Granite Prospect. And on either side of this, there are lawns. On the left, there's a slope that where flycatchers often perch on the other side of these Catalpa and Polonia trees to hunt insects over, over the sloped meadow. This is uh, that oriole I mentioned with those Polonia flowers. And what's really cool about these birds is that they pierce the base of these flowers and a lot of flowers with nectar and they drink the nectar. So what's neat is when you, when you walk up there on Granite Prospect, you'll see a lot of these fallen blossoms and they'll all have slits in them. And it's because the Orioles have just been eating or drinking the nectar. They slit the, slit the flower and go ahead and have a drink. So it definitely is a great habitat for Orioles. Also, one of my favorite trees is a Sweet Bay Magnolia. That's what this is. And it attracts certain birds. Not, not a lot of birds are interested in this fruit, but red-eyed vireos are definitely. And also Eastern Kingbirds. There are a lot of these on Pier 1, and as the park has grown, they've planted more and more of these, and it's a native tree. Uh, in the spring, its flower is amazing, a lemony scent. It is intoxicating, so I would definitely recommend uh, taking a whiff of that if you, if you encounter Sweet Bay. Now, also on Pier 1, I call this area the Dark Forest. A lot of the locals, we, call, we all call it the Dark Forest because it kind of it doesn't look like you're in New York City. It's uh, this canopy that fills up during, during the summer. And it really has so many warblers, so many vireos uh, during migration. And then during summer, we have a lot of species nesting here, including gray catbird and song sparrows and things like that. And this path is set above the long pond, which I mentioned is where that rail eventually found itself. Uh, and I will show you a picture of that as well. But along this dark forest, we get great views of black and white warblers. I mean, one of the things about my patch is a lot of the trees are young. Pier 1 has the most mature trees, but we still have a lot of young shrubs and things like that. So you get amazing views of the warblers. And then the catbirds. Uh, I don't know if you have catbirds right now, but we, we still have them. Usually um, there's some in New York City, but never before in my patch in the winter have I had them stay. But we've, we actually have several of them this winter, which is pretty interesting. There were a lot of juniper berries available and I think that, that um, they were congregated around there and I think that attracted them. So this is that long pond I've been talking about. That, that structure way in the back there is the Brooklyn Bridge. So it gives you an idea how close Pier 1 is to the Brooklyn Bridge. And there, so it's hard to see, but there's a, a pond there in the back. And this, this pond attracts all sorts of amazing things. There's that um, black elderberry on the left there. There's sumac, that, the big uh, bushy tree on the left, that series of uh, trees overhanging the water, are staghorn sumac. And that's a magnet for a lot of birds. And it also provides food for birds in the winter. So right now the staghorn sumac is there on leafless trees and the birds are using it as a food source. But uh, this, this uh, strand of sumac here over the water attracts Eastern Phoebes. Um, also a prothonotary war warbler eventually found it. It took a long time, 
But um, my coworker at the lab of ornithology, Tim Lenz, awesome birder, when he came to visit my patch, he saw the long pond and he said, oh, is this where you saw the prothonotary warbler? And I said, how did you know? He said, well, this is, this is the habitat they like. <laughs> so it took it long enough, but it eventually found it and clocked in as my 160th species in the park. Also in that long pond, we have green herons that, that hang out during the day. Also um, black crowned night herons, which are foraging during the day. And the great thing about um, both of these herons is that they're helping us take care of the invasive koi that are in our pond. So it's quite a bonus. Um, we get to see them and they get to help us out. A lot of times too, when the, when the black crowned night herons aren't hunting, they'll be roosting under those giant catalpa leaves. So this was when I first started birding Brooklyn Bridge Park, I was chasing some uh, little brown job. I wasn't sure what it was. I was looking for it, looked up and saw these two giant yellow feet. And this got this photo, the black crowned night heron staring down at me. And these are regular visitors to Brooklyn Bridge Park. Very, very easy to see during the summer. And even a, a juvenile hung around uh, into late fall and winter this year. So uh, I'm always, uh, I, there was a picture I really wanted because I have this book, Brooklyn Bridge Park, that came out in 2016. And I wanted to get this photo of a barn swallow collecting mud. So at the long pond, I had seen the barn swallows collecting mud for their nests because we have the piers, as I showed you in that satellite map, and the barn swallows make nests under the piers. They use mud and dry grasses. So there, it's really cool because they're here with us all summer long. But I really wanted to get this photo. And uh, I asked one of the gardeners uh, when the water source was gonna be turned on at the long pond because there was no mud. And uh, I said, you know, they're gonna be arriving soon and they need this for their nest. She said, don't worry. Uh, we're going to be turning on the water source and sure enough a couple of weeks later they did and i got my photo one of my favorite photos from the book of a barn swallow collecting mud um, these are great birds for raising awareness too if you if you lead bird walks or you're just walking around and want to show people birds the barn swallows are great because they're so abundant in the summer they fly low through the park paths uh, so it's a great species to get people excited about birds and especially when the young are around and the young are fledged in the summer and uh, they're really, really vocal and they're waiting for the parents to feed them. So when I lead bird walks, I just, I love it when the barn swallows are out there and they're easy to see and it's a real treat to see the young getting fed. And then at the end of summer, when they're getting ready to take off for South America, I actually had never seen this until this past migration but they appeared to be having a meeting that was uh, to plan their trip to South America. They all gathered and within the next day or two, they were all gone. <laughs> so they definitely um, changed their behaviors throughout the season. And it's so neat to see, as you know, the bird stages of growing up, the flight training that the, when the adults are leading the, the young around the park and getting ready for their journey south. Uh, now, Pier 1, I mentioned, was, was the main habitat when I started in 2012. There was also Pier 6, not the actual pier, but the, there was a playground area kind of by more near the mainland. And this does not look like a great place to go birding, right? It's packed. It's a water playground, tons of people. But really, this is one of the hot spots of Brooklyn Bridge Park. So these trees are actually not native. They're Don Redwoods. But uh, one day I saw all four of these warblers at once in this very tree. And what was so cool is it was a study of the behavior of birds because each of these birds was at their expected level of the tree. It was like a New York City apartment building. They all had their levels. So the red start was foraging high then the magnolia warbler below it. Common yellow throat was fairly low, but then the also the, uh, the black and white warbler was very low and kind of crawling around the rocks that you see there. So it was, it's really neat, especially when they, it's a water source. I think the birds love it because when they turn the fountains off and the people leave, uh, insects well up because of the water hanging around and the birds go crazy and they start fly catching and it's a sight. There's a platform here that the kids are playing on where the, where this arrow is. And what happens is a lot of leaf litter and, and other insects collect under that platform on this grate. And so this is, a, this is another clue because I birded this place so much, I know to check 
this great under platform for birds, warblers, uh, cat birds like it too, uh, wrens, all sorts of birds, uh, water thrush as well. That's also in that same area. It's a common yellow throat there. So I recently, I never witnessed this. I've been birding for 10 years and um, probably seven in the patch. And I'd never seen this territorial defense between two downy woodpecker males, but this was also in that little that little water lab area that I just showed you. Really fascinating here to take a look at. They stay still and then they, then they go again. <laughs> And it's interesting because I don't see, I, in this area, I did, I did not see a place like a snag where they could build a nest. So I'm not sure what this was about, but it was definitely interesting. So after 2012, um, I, I birded for, for quite a while. And then I released this book, Birding at the Bridge. And right when the book came out, all these new habitats started opening. So there were, I was adding to my list. I had 134 species photos and stories of most of those birds in my book. And right when the book was released is Pier 6 Meadow opened, which is close to that, that water lab playground I just showed you, but this is the actual pier. And they built a flower field out here, which has been amazing. It rivals Pier 1 now. And it, it attracts hummingbirds, sparrows. I've had Vesper Sparrow. Um, also a lot of Lincoln sparrows here. And in the back, there's a lawn that also has um, goldenrod uh, along the edge of the pier. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of this. So I, I discovered this flower, it's called a pink turtle head, uh, popped up in, in the Pier 6 meadow this, this fall. I'd never seen it before. And uh, there was a yellow warbler eating from within the flower. They're really fascinating. They're kind of like succulent flowers. They look pretty hardy. And the beautiful purple aster there as well. This is just when these, what's interesting about the flower field is you can see the different flowers that bloom in stages. So the purple aster was one of the last ones in, that was still around in late fall and early winter. And it was really neat that that was the only thing in bloom, but it's really neat to see um, the stages of the flowers. Also at Pier 6, we, we have catalpas, which I mentioned, but they're a lot younger. So you get eye level views of birds like this red breasted nuthatch, which uh, has been erupting as we know. Recently, there were so many of these at Pier 6. And again, eye level, I mentioned the, the insects collecting on the undersides of these catalpa leaves and the uh, golden crack kinglet. I, it really gives you an idea of how little this bird weighs that it can hang by the midrib of a catalpa leaf to feed. Same thing with the with the uh, ruby crown. Oh, that's, he's not, he's so this is uh, this is what oh someone needs the mute. Someone needs the mute. Check your mutes, please. Oh, someone's gone. Okay, well I'll continue, but. There we go, thank you. So this is what the Pier 6 Meadow looks like when everything's not in bloom. And it does look a little unkempt and a little messy, but really it's still attracting birds. When it gets like this in the fall and or in early winter, this is why we get Lincoln sparrows hanging around. Also clay colored sparrow has been around here. We had a um, juvenile white crown sparrow and they really love it. Plus a lot of the birds love the seed heads that are left over from when the flowers were in bloom. And it just attracts so such a variety of, of seed eaters and also um, the leaf litter is great too. So here's a Lincoln Sparrow that was uh, kind of on the back section I mentioned that has a lot of goldenrod. Um, I really lucked out on that, that shot. But this, uh, the Pine Siskins loved Pier 6 this fall, uh, hopefully you got to see a lot of them as well. And I had up to 30 visit at a time here and just beautiful shots here in this flower field. Once again, flower field, So this bird was so close that that railing is about two feet high. It's a metal railing that's at the bottom and you get incredible views of these birds. This bird stuck around a long time. Uh, that kind of pink fluff is Joe Pieweed, another um, really, really abundant flower in the flower field and throughout Brooklyn Bridge Park. Another uh, thing that we have in the flower field are giant pink hibiscus flowers and the gray catbirds. I didn't know this, just this past fall, I saw it eating the, uh, the pollen. <laughs> Got a great shot of the pollen all over its face. 
So, so those were the biggies. So, so Pier One and then Pier Six, and then uh, this marina opened in 2016. And as you can imagine, apart from these two habitats, there were plenty of ducks. There were bufflehead, uh, red-breasted merganser. Um, it's it's a tidal estuary, so brackish water. So we didn't have any. We don't get a lot of freshwater ducks. They'll if we do, there's like one. But even still, I was a little worried that the marina being put in at the park was going to affect the bird life. And it, it did a little, I did see the, the duck numbers decrease, but, but look what happened when they put in the marina. They created basically the largest gull roost. This is only a third of it. In the winters, we get 4,000 or more ring-billed gulls at this marina. And it's, it's fun if you're into gulling and into the cold to go pick them out during the winter, you can pick out rarities. So I've seen a black headed gull and there's been an Iceland gull here as well. Um, so really cool. But also just what's neat about, if you see that view, let me, let me back up because I want, you, I want you to see this view. It gives you an idea in the back there, you see prairie grasses and you see a bunch of cars. That's a Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So this park is long, as I mentioned, it's very narrow and it's right under the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. So what they've done is built some berms along there to kind of muffle the sound. It kind of works. And uh, so anyway, this, uh, you never know what you're gonna get with, with uh, changes to the park. And this turned out to be an amazing gull roost here. So pretty, the, the next piece of habitat to open is pretty close to that gull roost. Um, also, this is kind of on the back end, there's a berm, one of those sound berms. So literally right on the other side of that is the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And I, I really didn't see much when this opened. I, I really didn't go over here too much, uh, but then I, did, I discovered this path. See where there's benches there up on the left, kind of in the middle, and I called it the secret path. So I started checking it out because there were some prairie grasses and you, know, you never know what you can find. So I, I gave it a try. Um, and uh, this is the secret path. You, as you can see, this there's this switchgrass, and it's it's pretty, you know, it's all over the place. But it's great, a great source of food for birds in the winter. And it really is because a painted bunning found it. So you know, this painted bunning definitely proved that having the right habitat and having you know a food resource can attract anything really. This painted bunning wasn't supposed to be there. It doesn't even breed in the area. It doesn't migrate through, but it showed up last winter. It's 2019, but was really last winter, December. And um, this was a, a juvenile male we determined because we got different uh, pictures of it a lot. It was here two months. I found it, I think on the 29th of December. So uh, a lot of people came and got it as their last bird of, of 2019 or their first bird of 2020. Uh, but what was interesting that along that secret path, I, I heard a couple walking by that path one time saying, what is, it's so messy here, all this, what is this? You know, it looks like a fire hazard. <laughs> and I, I didn't say anything, but I felt like saying, well, the painted bunny, you know, we need the painted bunny to come by. But really a lot of times these habitats that look really unkempt and they're not, you know, ornate and, and perfectly manicured, that's what the birds prefer. And um, there's a great book by Doug Tallamy called uh, Nature's Best Hope. And if you haven't read it, oh, I highly recommend it. It's all about how, um, you know, manicured lawns and things like that don't really attract birds. And people don't think there are birds around, but once they start planting native plantings with some understory and, and trees that foster caterpillars and all of this, the bird life increases. So really it's, it's just great. Here's a, a better picture of that painted bunny. You can see a little bit of a bright green and, and actually a lot of bright green. And it really um, made a lot of, a lot of birders happy. Over a hundred birders came to see this bird. Um, uh, it actually oscillated between this, this pier and another pier that I'm going to show you in a minute, but um, it even made the news. I didn't submit this photo, but someone said, Heather, your bird, is on the news. <laughs> That's how Twitter works, right? So um, not the best picture, but what I love about when birds make the news is because it, it creates a spark for some people. There, you may have heard about the Mandarin duck in Central Park. I didn't go see it, you know, and it was probably an escaped exotic, but really that bird was a spark bird for a lot of people and got them into birding and got them to care more about conservation and nature. So really anytime we can get a bird on the news, I think it's great. <laughs> 
So um, talking about the other habitat that the painted bunning visited, it was this Pier 3, which um, is this huge lawn, as you can see, with a gorgeous view. And um, th the surrounding area has a little, little tufts of, of prairie grasses as well, little blue stem, switchgrass, also some blackberry bushes. Um, also in the back there, there's a, a lot of cedars and junipers that I mentioned, uh, the gray catbirds were, were hanging out this winter. So it's great. I found um, I found a Nelson sparrow here in fall 2019, right on the lawn. It wasn't skittish at all. Only stayed a few days, but uh, that was a really really great find. And what's neat about the park is, I, it doesn't it doesn't like have um, it has like natural natural water sources for the birds. So there are these granite blocks that they repurposed from. I don't know, some old construction or old buildings and they have them around the park and there are depressions in them. And the birds always are using those to take baths. Same thing with, with these logs. So this is a log in uh, at Pier 3 and the water collects here and the birds always use this as a bird bath. This white-throated sparrow loved it. People describe this as a water slide. <laughs> these, these, so these pictures, yeah, I took these all in the park obviously, but um, so it's just really neat, the, the designers, uh, Michael von Valkenberg and Associates that created the park, designed it with birds in mind and pollinators. So uh, with a lot of native plantings and, and depressions for, for bird baths and things like that. So before Pier 3 had opened, there was a little bit of, of funny funny business going on. I, I, would, I would check out the pier, even though it wasn't open yet, and I thought I saw a coyote, I saw this. It wasn't real, it turned out to be a cardboard cutout. They were trying to prevent the geese from eating all the grass that they had just laid down, but you know, it just did not work. And it really didn't work. They even tried that one in the back left is a, is a plastic coyote, a 3D plastic coyote. So right, and there's three here, did not phase the geese and it was pretty hilarious. Um, also, this is also pier three before they laid down the grass. Remember I showed you the ring-billed gulls at that giant roost? What they used to do before this pier was developed was stage here at sunset on Pier 3, and then they take off when the sun, right when the sun was dropping below the horizon, and they go over to the marinas, which was right to the left there, right south of it. So uh, I'd get these amazing views with the industrial feel and, and the skyscrapers, and that was something that we lost when that pier was developed. So I do miss that, but that's the thing about not just urban parks and habitats, but really anywhere we bird, um, you know, the habitat changes and we have to, we do have to make it known like what's important. This is just something that I want for myself, but important bird habitats, we want to make it known that the birds are using them. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that too, about how I've uh, developed a dialogue with the park to do that. Also at Pier 3, um, we, we had common terns. During the summer, we have common terns coming by. Believe it or not, we, we had a pair trying to nest on the platforms, but it, they, it wasn't successful. It was the first time we'd ever seen them because they do nest at Governor's Island uh, during the summers, but uh, this was the first time we'd ever seen one nesting here. So may, hopefully uh, next season, but we had so many torrential downpours this past summer that I think that that might've done them in but really neat to see their courtship. So this is the very last habitat. This just opened this year, um, actually after the pandemic started at Pier 2. Those are sports courts a little to the left. You can see a little bit, but um, this grass is little blue stem. And uh, I've seen indigo bunning here. I've seen Lincoln Sparrow in winter here. The great thing about this place is you can bird at night because it's well lit it's safe so i go birding here at night and this is one of my favorite paths to bird at night because uh lincoln sparrows tend to forage at night also swap sparrows so come 2021 right now there's a lot of ground in this patch to cover it's just amazing when i started it was pier one now we have pier three six all of these habitats so now you know i i start work every day at 9 a.m so I just can't bird the whole patch. So I have to bird many patches within the patch because there's so many habitats. But the great thing is because I post my pictures on social media, 
I lead walks that other people are birding this. This was really underbirded when I started, but now people are finding out about it. And um, so they can tell me what they see when, when I'm at work. So it's great. So how does this and patch birding, how does this raise awareness in our communities? Uh, really, even just being out there, when someone sees us birding and they ask us what we're doing or um, they, you know, they're interested, it's an opportunity for all of us to share birds and share the potential of this person, you know, taking an interest in nature and conservation. So I show you the scarlet tanager because this was at, at Pier 3, not in the pier, but in this uplands more on the main path. And it was, it's perched on an apple. It was eating an apple. I couldn't pull, I mean, this was, I've never had a better view of a scarlet tanager in my whole life. I sat on the lawn and I was taking photos of it. People started to notice me though. They, they saw me taking the photo with the long lens and then they saw what I was taking the photo of. So my being out there with the big lens, I brought attention to this bird and it drew a crowd and it was so magical to see all of these people taking pictures with their phones of a male scarlet tanager. And a few months later, I was at a coffee shop in the park and a guy goes, oh, were you the one taking a picture of that red bird? And I said, oh yeah. He goes, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't really want to say anything at the time, but we saw it and now we've been birding and, and all this. So thank you so much. So really just the presence of us being out there is a big deal. And the thing about an urban patch is you're more visible because you have a lot of people coming through, people from all over the world too. So you have a lot of big tur uh, tourist attraction with all the views and you can share it with a lot of people. So I'm very fortunate. Also through bird walks, that is a big way to uh, raise awareness. And uh, I lead these for through my, through my own meetup and also for the park and things. And a lot of times I get really busy and people say, when are you going to have another walk? And I say, is Saturday good for you? I'll book one Saturday. <laughs> right now I'm not doing walks because of the pandemic. And I, you know, I just, I have a trouble with the, trouble with ma the mask. I can't like really project my voice because I can't breathe. But um, when I am doing walks, I'm very, I love doing them and I'm happy to, to schedule a walk. So, so if any of you are coming down here, just let me know and I will schedule a walk <laughs> at times with your visit. So another interesting thing that I found with patch birding is the, this is the gardening staff from when I did my book back in 2016 and they were awesome. And they would tip me off to red tailed hawk in the park, which took me a while to get a photo of, cause I really needed to get photos of all these birds for the book. And, um, but what I found is that a lot of the gardeners, they're creating these amazing habitats that attract these birds, planting native, native shrubs and trees. But believe it or not, a lot of them aren't aware how well it's working because this is, this is Bird Island. This is uh, near uh, between Pier, basically between Pier 5 and 3. Um, and they called this Bird Island and this was kind of what they built to attract birds. But really, Bird Island doesn't have any birds. And, you know, I say I joke, but it does. Occasionally, birds stop by, a hummingbird stop by there and things like that. But um, also, there's an osprey platform there to the left that an osprey has never used. But, but what happened was I would tell them where I'd see, see the birds. So I tell them, you know, these sweet bay magnolias are really attracting the birds. I've, you know, I would mention, you know, there's a there's a red-eyed vireo there in the Sweet Bay of Magnolia. So they'd start to notice uh, these things. Also, the head horticulturist would take note. At this point, my book was out. So um, when they would start to notice, oh, I never knew that we got Baltimore Orioles. I never knew we had an indigo bunting here. But they were the ones that were creating these habitats. So it's, I would highly recommend uh, communicating with the gardening staff or horticulturists about how well um, certain habitats are working because that will encourage them to plant more of those types of, of vegetation. And also uh, it'll let them know what a great job they're doing because it's really just amazing. So now all of them are really into birds and they really look forward to the next species we're gonna get in the park. So I, I had the opportunity to present to them as well. I did a talk for them about what was working and you know how the birds were using the habitats. I told them to keep the leaf litter because it's great. 
if we didn't have leaf litter, litter we wouldn't have so many um, white-throated sparrows in the winter doing their double hot scratch and all sorts of sparrows like fox and things like that. And of course the oven bird, I mean, we gotta have the oven bird and um, I love it. Um, you just look at leaf litter for about 10 minutes during migration here and you're guaranteed to see an oven bird doing its chicken strut right through that leaf litter. Another biggie is this bayberry. So last winter, we had a big winter here last winter because we had the painted bunting for two months. We had a couple of field sparrows and we had about 20 yellow rump warblers. That was because we had one yellow rump warbler a few years ago. And I mentioned to um, Rebecca that the bayberries uh, were really attracting the yellow rump warbler because they're one of the few birds that can digest this very hard waxy berry. And because of that, they can stay through the winter if, if this is available. So um, when they develop Pier 3, they took that um, advice and they planted a bunch of bayberry bushes. There's so many bayberry bushes over there. So last winter, we had about 20 yellow rumps. What happened this year is all the bayberries are gone. I think we had such a busy migration. You probably did too. Fall was off the hook. I, I just, it was crazy. And most of the berries were picked off. So I think we only have one yellow rump warbler this winter. But really, it's it's really important to know about what what's working and, and to tell the gardening staff that. Same thing with little blue stems. So what, what's great with the gardeners now is when they're about to cut uh, any prairie grasses, like little blue stem or switchgrass, they call me. So sometimes Rebecca, the head horticulturist calls me or she'll have one of her staff call me. I'll get a call. Yeah, this is so-and-so, Rebecca told me to call you, is it okay to cut the grass? <laughs> because they don't wanna disturb uh, potential nest sites or anything like that. And it's just, I, I'm so fortunate that, that I have this dialogue with the park and it makes me feel comfortable at this point to let them know if I see something going on like construction and let them know about nest sites that could be affected. It took a long time to get here, you know, uh, really did, it took a few years to develop this dialogue and really get it to a point where they look to me for, uh, to, to assist in, in this habitat preservation for the birds, but it's, it's totally worth it. And don't get discouraged if you, if you don't see it moving along because eventually it will, it definitely will. Um, the growing list of birds in my patch, I mentioned I had 134 in the book, but I always wanted this Blackburnian warbler, but they, they forage really high and we just don't have too many mature trees. I had birded, I had seen one in Prospect Park and I remember cranking my neck, getting the warbler neck to see, see it so far away. And then in May, 2020, um, this bird appeared in a, in a strange habitat. It wasn't, it wasn't high at all. Uh, and it clocked in at, at that number, it's hidden from me, but it's, uh, there it is 166. But um, it was actually in these sparse trees that were on a, along a main path connecting Pier 1 and 2, which is a really weird place. So you really never know what you're gonna see. Uh, Blackbirdian was great at 166. Now this is the clay colored, this, uh, this was pretty recent. Uh, this was this actually in November, so, um, What's interesting is that in the fall, because of the pandemic, the gardening staff wasn't around to clear a lot of this vegetation. So there were weeds growing, and this is a weed at South Thistle. This clay colored sparrow loved this South Thistle. It was there and then it, it flew off, but I just sat down and waited in front of the South Thistle and it came back. <laughs> and I posted the, the plant on iNaturalist and one of the gardeners said, I'm so glad that this bird is eating the seeds of this weed. I heard this is edible too. I never tried to eat it, but um, apparently it's an edible plant. Um, also, most recently, just a week or two ago, someone texted me and said there's an American widgeon. I mentioned we don't we don't get a lot of a lot of freshwater ducks or certain ducks we only get you know singles of. I'd never seen an American widgeon, never been reported in the park before, and it showed up this February. So it was quite a treat to have this visitor a very cooperative too. So really there's always something new. The thing about patch burning, it can, like when I started burning, I would, I would twitch a lot. I'd go look for rare birds and things like that. I had a car in Florida, but here I don't have a car and uh, it's kind of a challenge for me to try to find new things in the park, but it's really not just about birds. 
I've seen amazing things that really have nothing to do with birds, like this harbor seal, uh, which was on a kayak platform at, at Pier 2 in 2018. Really rare for them to come this far up, you know, uh, along the East River here. Also, I I saw laughing gull that uh, had something in its bill, snapped away, snapped away. And when I looked at my pictures, I literally gasped out loud because I captured this photo of a line seahorse uh, looking up at the laughing gull. I won't tell you what happened next, but you could probably guess. <laughs> and, but really the exciting thing about having an urban patch for me, as exciting as all these beautiful warblers and migrating birds are, are some of the common birds doing amazing things. So we had, you know, we're having snow. It looks like there's more on the way and all of the fresh water sources had dried up. So it was interesting to see these birds doing what they could to get water. And this was a gray cat bird, which actually is rare here during the winter, but it's common in other seasons. But it was actually drinking droplets off of a handrail here in the park, really, really getting creative with water sources. Uh, also, same thing with pigeons. I'm fascinated with pigeons when they're doing their, their dance, their courtship dance, where they do turns for the, for the females. And also I was snapping away, taking photos of this one stretching. And uh, I never knew that they could make a turkey pose like this, but I captured this photo as well. So really spending a lot of time with the common birds is really fun. Uh, I love seeing uh, common birds fight the house sparrows and the uh, rock pigeons fighting over a waffle cone here at a ice cream store in the park. And then this is a yellow rut warbler and right where its bill is, there are a bunch of aphids and it's just, just the aphids were, were crawling along the, the leaf and it just was devouring them. And just the observation, I just love seeing these behaviors and it makes me so happy when the birds find a food source, really. Uh, and when they have an abundance of food, like that painted bunning, you just know it can, it can hang out for that two months and be fine. And that's, that really makes me feel good. Um, also, Northern Mockingbird is very common in New York City, but it's not common to see it like this. It looks like something out of a cartoon. Uh, and this was on at Pier 6. Uh, and really, I've also developed an interest in insects and plants because once you get into birds, as you know, it's all connected. You realize that I, just, I didn't realize that before I started birding, but now I'm just so into the whole thing, including insects. And uh, one of the gardeners, uh, his name's Pavel, and he, uh, I, oh, sorry about that. Someone's trying to ring into my building, but he, uh, he knows all about insects. He's an amazing naturalist. So I invited him on one of my bird walks during the summer when you know there were not too many birds around. And I said, you could show the bird walkers insects. And uh, so, so, sorry, that distracted me. I'm so sorry about that. But, uh, and he came and he stole the show. He really did. I, he, he introduced us to this candy striped leaf hopper which it looks pretty big here, but it's probably uh, an eighth of an inch long. <laughs> pretty amazing. Also, he showed me this spice bush swallowtail caterpillar. These are all in Brooklyn Bridge Park, all happening in the patch. And I waited to get a shot of this hummingbird clear wing, and it was definitely worth it. These uh, are beautiful, beautiful moths. Now, really, all of these changes in the patch, you know, I who knows what's going to happen next, but um, really, Still, through all of this, my favorite bird is still going to be the white-throated sparrow. Here we go. Because, I mean, it's just, it's got a beautiful song and it gets me through the winter. The cold winter right now, I know I can go out and see a white-throated sparrow. Interestingly enough, we had a pair here in the summer. We were hoping for them to nest. Once again, I think those storms we had might have affected it because I saw a pair, a bunch of us saw a pair and it seemed like it was gonna happen. And I think that would have been the first nesting pair in New York City. So maybe, maybe this summer, but you just see how the, the appropriate habitat can result in some amazing things. So it seems like I have everything in my patch, right? What could I possibly want? Uh, I'm so lucky, I know, but really I want a Northern Sawwet Owl and I still, 
have yet to find that, but I've heard March is a great month to do that. So wish me luck. And um, I'd love to hear any questions you have. And also uh, please keep in touch. You can follow me on social media. I post my pictures. If you go to brooklynridgebirds.com, you'll see all my social media channels and my email. Uh, if you ever wanna go for a walk in Brooklyn Bridge Park, please uh, just reach out and thank you so much. I'm gonna stop the share and maybe we can move on to questions. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank you. And we do have some questions. And uh, one of them is about visiting Brooklyn Bridge Park. And the question is about uh, parking near the, near the park. Uh, there's somebody that has limited mobility. Um, a, a friend of somebody want, has limited mobility, can't take um mass transit but right. i would like yeah. to bird the park it, because it, it looks so flat it is you know and i and that's a reminder because i need to enter it on birdability if you haven't heard about birdability it lists birding areas and their accessibility it is definitely accessible there is uh there are a couple of metered parking spots but there are also paid parking lots at pier six and also in dumbo near pier one uh, so yeah, I mean, you can, I, I, I'd say Pier 6 is probably your best bet. That's off the Atlantic Avenue exit off the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. And yes, it is, it is very flat. Um, there are some stairs like in the Long Pond area, but they're pretty easy to navigate and find ways around that. Great question. Uh, Lori G wants to know what camera equipment you use. Yeah. So I always said I'd never do bird photography, but I wanted to share it with everyone. And that was the only way I wrote. So I, I bought a Canon EOS uh, 7D and uh, I've got a 100 to 400 millimeter Canon lens. And uh, one of the tips, if you've got that kind of a setup, um, this, this local photographer, Birder Charles Chesler, told me shoot on aperture priority at the setting of eight. And that way you could focus on the chest of the bird. You don't have to focus on the eye and it will still be clear. And then if the bird's cooperative, you can bump it down to the 5.6 to try to get that amazing, amazing shot. But he, that tip saved me. Uh, Carl wants to know, where is the old Brooklyn Navy Yard in relationship to the park? Yeah, the Brooklyn Navy Yard is a little, is north of that. So it's gonna be, um, probably another half a mile, mile north of the park. The park actually does extend beyond the Brooklyn Bridge a little bit, but I never go up there because not only is it a little far, but I never, when I go there, I don't see much. What plant attracted the painted bunting? That's switchgrass, switchgrass. Okay, and what's the park like now? Is it snow and ice covered? So they, they did a great job of clearing the paths. Um, so the paths are cleared. I'm still birding every day. Um, like that Pier 3 expanse where I saw the Nelson Sparrow, the big lawn, that's covered in, in ice. The, the snow has really become packed. But it is, it is beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's really nice. The birds are having trouble finding water. Um, they, it, what's interesting is there's that Pier Bird Island so there's that Pier 4 beach and a lot of the sparrows are finding that because it's really the op only open ground available. So there's a bunch of song sparrows and white-throated sparrows foraging on the beach, which is kind of weird. Does anybody else have questions? Thanks so much for your kind words. I see, see a lot of kind words and I really appreciate it. Yeah, I gotta agree with Terrence, it was awesome. Thanks so much. Terrence, I recognize you from uh, Facebook and I think we we follow each other. So great, great to meet you here. All right, thank you, Heather. That was fantastic. Thank you so uh, much. Our next uh, uh, meeting will be um, March 9th and it's members night and we'll have an opportunity to 
share one another's photos. So if you would, uh, if you would like uh, to share some of your photos, uh, go to our uh, website and uh, and check the link for uh, for sharing photos. Uh, we've got photos from a few people, but we would like some more. So um, please do that. Also, uh, I've recorded this program and uh, I'll be posting it uh, on our website tomorrow or what's today, Tuesday, tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday. And um, thanks everyone for attending.